Hey, I'm Justin, and I need to help a stork deliver babies. Don't ask how I got roped into this. But I'm not actually delivering the babies, I'm just in charge of planning the path for my stork friend to take. And it's through planning this path that we'll explore concepts from both fractal geometry and computer science, as well as their beautiful intersection, all while relying on no prior knowledge other than counting in binary. I wanted to make this video because fractals are often presented as these cool mathematical objects that mostly exist to look pretty and be fun to draw, or in my case, anime. I remember being in middle school and watching Vihart's video about the dragon curve and being so inspired that I went out and bought a graph paper notebook just for doodling fractals. It was a great time, but it didn't go much further than that. And something that I don't think is emphasized nearly enough is that fractals are really useful tools. Here, I'm going to show how a certain class of fractals can be used to speed up memory fetching in computer science. So let's get back to the problem. The town that the stork is responsible for has 64 houses arranged in an 8x8 grid like this, and each house needs exactly one of 64 babies. So planning the path seems pretty simple. Any line that passes through every house would work, like this spiral. But there's something interesting about the babies that we have to take into account. Each baby is numbered from 0 to 63, and this number tells us who they will get along with. Babies with numbers that are close together will be good friends, and babies with numbers that are far apart probably won't get along too well. For example, babies 0 and 63 won't want anything to do with each other, but baby 0 will be the best of friends with baby 1 and still pretty cool with baby 7. Assuming that the stork delivers the babies in ascending order, our job is to find the path for the stork to take that will maximize friendship and happiness by placing the babies whose numbers are similar near each other. Looking at this spiral, if we label all the houses in order, we can see that this isn't exactly the best path. There are many pairs of neighbors whose numbers are very far apart, so we'll have to do better. Let's formalize our goal a little more. We want to create a mapping between the first 64 natural numbers and the coordinates of an 8x8 grid, and we want this mapping to be bijective, which is just a fancy term meaning that every input has exactly one unique output, and every output in turn has exactly one corresponding input. This means that we should be able to work in either direction, taking in the coordinates of a house and returning the corresponding baby's number, or taking in a baby's number and returning the coordinates of their house. For now, we'll start with the coordinates. Since we're writing an algorithm, and most computers work in binary, it might be helpful to convert the coordinates to binary. The maximum value of each coordinate is just 7, so we only need 3 bits to represent each one. And then for the baby numbers, since they go up to 63, we need 6 bits to represent them. Something important to note is that the number of digits in each coordinate in binary is half the number of digits in the baby number. This makes sense, because binary is base 2, and 8 is 2 to the power of 3, while 64 is that squared, or 2 to the power of 6. So a pretty easy way to turn two coordinates, each with three digits, into one number with six digits is just to concatenate them. If we put the y coordinate followed by the x coordinate, the house at 0, 0 will get baby 0, the house at 1, 0 will get baby 1, and the house at 2, 0 will get baby 2. Since the y-coordinate in this first row is 0, these houses will just get the baby whose number matches their x-coordinate. But once we get to the second row, the house at 0, 1 will get baby 8, because 1, 0, 0, 0 is 8 in binary. If we keep going down this first column, the house at 0, 2 will get baby number 16, the house at 0, 3 will get baby number 24, and the baby numbers will keep increasing by 8 as we go down. Now I'll just fill in the rest of the houses, and then connect them in the order of their baby numbers. So this zigzag is the path that the stork would fly if we choose this algorithm. And it's not too bad. The numbers along each of the rows are consecutive, so the horizontal streets would get along pretty well. The issue is with the columns. Baby 0 is right next to baby 8, which isn't terrible, but then one more house down is baby 16, and then 24, and that's not ideal. Every single baby has to deal with not liking their vertical neighbors. The reason why this is happening is because the Y coordinate represents all the most significant bits in the baby number, meaning that changing the Y coordinate by even just a little bit will have a way bigger effect than changing the X coordinate, which represents the least significant bits. 
A good way to test if a certain path will result in lots of friendship is to randomly sample small blocks of houses to go away on a camping trip together, and see how well the babies get along. If we choose a block that is longer horizontally, it should be a pleasant car ride, because all the babies have pretty close numbers. But if we choose a block that is taller, there's probably going to be a fight to break up. There is a name for this property that we're after. It's called the preservation of spatial locality. So we would say that a zigzag doesn't do a very good job at preserving spatial locality because babies will often not get along with their neighbors. The locality that we're trying to preserve with our path is that in two-dimensional space, meaning that we want houses that are close together or spatially local in the two-dimensional town to also be close together on the path, whose ordering is one-dimensional like on a number line. As we can see here, the issue with the zigzag is with vertical neighbors, but to its credit, it does do a very good job, the best job in fact, at preserving the locality of horizontal neighbors. We are essentially flattening this town to one dimension while trying to preserve the neighbor relation as best we can. The next version of our algorithm should do a better job of this by having more of a balance in terms of which bits the coordinates represent, to avoid what happened last time. Both the x and y coordinates should each have an effect on the more and less significant bits in the baby number. So one idea would be, instead of concatenating the coordinates, to alternate between them. And as you'll see in just a moment, this does give rise to the much-anticipated fractals. So in the case of the coordinate 0, 7, take the first bit of the y coordinate, then the first bit of the x coordinate, and alternate between the two to get a baby number of 42. Doing this is called bit interleaving. Here's another example with the coordinate 5, 3, which maps to the number 27 after interleaving. Notice how both coordinates contribute to both the least and most significant bits in the baby number. This should allow for groups of neighbors to get along better. So let's reassign the babies according to this new algorithm, and we can start connecting them to get the path. The first four houses make this Z pattern. Then the next four make the same Z pattern shifted over to the right. The next eight do the exact same thing shifted down. But what's interesting is that these four Zs themselves make up a larger Z pattern. Then if we continue with the rest of the grid, we'll get three more copies of this top left quadrant in an even bigger Z pattern. I think it's pretty cool that such an interesting pattern arises from such a simple procedure. Let's see if we can understand why this might be happening by going over the path again, but this time paying extra close attention to the bits of the baby number. We go horizontally from 0 to 1. Then we go diagonally to house 2, and this is when the 1's bit carries over to the 2's bit. Then it's horizontal once more to house 3, and now there's an even longer diagonal to house 4, when the 2's bit carries over to the 4's bit. Then the same Z pattern again, and then this even longer diagonal from 7 to 8 also lines up with when the 4's bit carries over to the 8's bit. So you may be picking up on a pattern. Every time there's a diagonal, that's when there's some carryover in the bits of the baby number. And the length of the diagonal depends on how significant a bit is being carried over. So the longest diagonal on the path is going from house 31 to 32, because that's when there's a carryover to the 32's bit the most significant bit in the number. Since the bits in this number represent the interleaved coordinates, carrying over to a significant bit is sort of like resetting the coordinates, because all of these ones become zeros. But let's not lose sight of our original goal. This path does an excellent job at preserving spatial locality. All four quadrants in the town have a maximum difference in baby number of just 16, and if we randomly select a small block of houses to go on a camping trip, it's likely that the babies in them will be friends. Unsurprisingly, this type of path already has a name because it's really commonly used in computer science to efficiently store and visualize data. It's called a z-order curve, and that makes sense because, well, z's. And it's about as good of a stork path as we're going to get. I'd like to take a moment now to decode the analogy of this video because I know it's a little opaque. The town and all the houses in it represent some two-dimensional data set. A common real-world example of this is GPS data. A baby's number represents the address of its house in memory, and 
houses, or data points, that are close together in two-dimensional space are more likely to go on road trips or be accessed together. Think of a GPS navigating through a city, only needing information about the surrounding area. And for two babies to get along means for two data points to be stored near each other in memory, or for their addresses to be similar. This is desirable because it makes accessing their data together with a CPU much faster. So in this way, friendship and happiness in the town are analogous to the preservation of spatial locality on a computer. This is why many systems use Z-ordering to store data. It keeps blocks of information that are likely to be accessed together near each other in memory. Earlier, I promised that this would be a video about fractals, and this is it. If we continue to add houses by subdividing the grid, making it finer and finer, the corresponding z-order curve will visit more and more points in the square, and at that point at infinity, where there are infinitely many houses and the z-order curve is infinitely detailed, it will have visited every single point in the square, leaving no gaps. For this reason, this path belongs to a family of fractals known as space-filling curves. And thanks to their locality-preserving properties, XKCD chose to use one of these space-filling curves in his map of the internet, which shows how all the IPv4 addresses on the internet are divided. And here's another, more detailed map that I found on a blog post. So while I hope that I have convinced you that certain fractals have undoubtedly useful properties, let's not lose sight of the fact that they are still really fun to look at. So enjoy this outro sequence.